Today's video is sponsored by Hawthorne, a premium tailored cologne brand, and they have a special offer for you, so stay tuned. So now that we have a rolling chassis, we are getting a lot closer to working on starting this thing, getting it running, uh, which we've never started it because it came in a crate. So hopefully it runs. Um, and later on in this episode, we'll be working on all the exciting parts of that. But before we really do anything, we need an oil tank because this is a dry sump motor. So it needs an external oil tank to hold all the oil. And obviously we can't start it without oil. So this is the tank that it originally had. Obviously there's uh, not really space for that. And these are the oil lines that go to it. So using uh, maybe some parts from this, definitely using these oil lines, uh, I'm gonna build a custom oil tank that will be hopefully made out of aluminum, which will make it lighter weight and also help it uh, cool the oil because all that surface area of the aluminum will dissipate the heat and keep the engine cooler, which, you know, this tank is made out of aluminum, so KTM probably knew what they were doing when they did that. First few pieces of aluminum have been found. Snowmobile scraps. Yup. Just digging through the pile, pulling it all out. Hopefully I don't have to make it out of too many itty bitty pieces, but you know, work with what we got. I came up with a good uh, location for the oil tank. Initially I was thinking maybe putting it under the engine here in the middle, uh, but I realized there's a lot of space on this side of the engine because of the asymmetry of its shape. And if I put it over here in front of this foot area, first of all, it'll get a lot of airflow, help keep the oil tank cool. Second of all, it'll offset the weight asymmetry of the engine. Uh, and also I can make the back side of it uh, the footboard or footrest. Um, so I'm gonna come up with something that works using cardboard aided design. <laughs> and then uh, I'll make the real thing out of all these scraps of snowmobile aluminum. Um, this time around we have a TIG welder that can do aluminum. So it'll turn out a lot better than when I built the uh, Odyssey tank out of similar material because then I was dealing with a spool gun, which is not the best way to weld aluminum. So I finished uh, most of my cardboard aided design for the uh, oil tank here. I think it's going to be a nice location, a nice size volume wise, and uh, a nice spot for your foot to rest on this plane here. Um, and the uh, whole thing comes right out of there. Now the problem is this is not enough aluminum to make it happen, uh, nor is it large enough chunks to not have to make this out of like 20 different pieces. So uh, we'll put that on hold until we can get a sheet of aluminum. And in the meantime, finally uh, put in the actual drive line over here. This has always just been a piece of inch and a quarter tubing that's stuck in there to hold in place. But now, Go Power Sports sent us another keyed inch and a quarter axle. So um, that'll be plenty strong and hollow, so as to save weight. I need these U joints to be 90 degrees offset from each other uh, for proper. Uh, phasing for the for to not have vibration in the drive line. So this keyway is only cut on one angle. So now I need to uh, find a way to rotate it 90 degrees and cut a key in the other end. Seeing as how we don't have any uh, proper cutting tools that I could put in the lathe chuck to cut this keyway, we're back to the North Idaho uh, spline cutter, keyway cutter, grinder lathe thing. So. I have the grinder on the um, tool holder here. I have the axle held nice and sturdy in the four jaw chuck, which is locked so it can't turn. And uh, now I'm gonna see how well it cuts. Oh,
got the new drive shaft in here. The uh, cutting the keyway with the grinder on the lathe totally worked. Um, that key is on, forward. You can see it right here, and uh, keys in there, nice and tight. U joint phasing is correct. They're 90 degrees offset, so you know minimal vibrations there, at least hopefully. Um, anyway, while I had this out, I've been thinking about uh, needing another carrier bearing at the front of the shaft because it, because of how long it is, it can wobble around due to the play in the splines going into the uh, differential. It's designed to have a little bit of play. Because of how long this shaft is to the front here, it's gonna create a lot of vibration and wobble if I don't support it. So the problem is I welded this U-joint yoke onto the end of the axle and then this end of it's larger diameter. So I can't just have a bearing that fits snugly on the um, drive shaft here because there's no way to get it on. So I've been thinking about how to deal with that and I just came up with a solution that I like which is this is another Subaru timing belt bearing <laughs> as we've used a lot before. Um, and the in internal diameter of this is just a hair smaller than the external diameter of the back of this U-joint yoke. So what I'm gonna do is pull this shaft out, throw it in the lathe, turn it down to fit nice and snug inside here. I'll press the bearing onto there and then make a housing for it, bolts to the chassis. We've got our bearing here, which fits nice and snug on here. And then we've got a sleeve that will need to be pressed onto the outside of the bearing, and then I can weld to this sleeve. So to press it on there, I'm gonna use this, the uh, hydraulic knockout punch. Bearing sits on the body of it nice there. And then that can go there. Oh, it's just big enough yep. all the way around. So handy. Nice. With a sleeve that thin, if you pressed it using, uh, you know, some other means or like the piranha, it'd be really easy to bend it and uh, get it crooked. And not that it would ever slide out of there because of how tightly it presses on, but, you know, hypothetically, because the bearing isn't totally press fit onto the shaft here, it could slide off aside from there's the sleeve with its little lip that makes it so it can't, so. It's perfect. Oh yeah. Super nice. All right guys, we'll get back to the build real quick. I just wanted to talk about the sponsor of this video, Hawthorne. Now Hawthorne is a premium tailored cologne brand. You take a quick quiz online and they tailor two fragrances for you. And we got a special deal for you guys, so stay tuned. Now I don't know about you guys, but I do not know enough about buying cologne. I would never spend time in a mall to do so. So where Hawthorne steps in is actually really cool. 
you just go online. I took this quick quiz. It asked me things like, what do I drink? What do I do? And then it tailored two fragrances for me and my lifestyle. And it was fun, easy. I've got my work and my play. Now my work is a very clean, woody smell. It's really nice. And my play is also woody. They must know that my work and play are kind of the same thing but it's also smoky and it's less clean. I know buying cologne online can sound like a leap of faith, but Hawthorne takes the risk out of it because they give you free shipping on your order and on returns. If you guys use the code GHPC, you will get 10% off your first order. I have the link in the description to go check it out. Now let's get back to building. Went to the scrap yard this morning and we found a bunch of good aluminum scrap, which is also street signs more importantly, a speed limit sign. If I do it right, I can get this whole section here to say speed on it, and that'll be the section you'd see from under the fender. Uh, obviously, I'll have to grind some of this off to weld it, but I should be able to keep at least enough of the speed to uh, be able to still read it, which is awesome. We also grabbed some extra ones to uh, put around the track. You turn a uh, speed limit sign into an oil tank. Obviously not finished, but uh, I managed to keep the entire word speed. <laughs> Had to chop the S in half and weld it back together, but it still, still says more or less speed limit. Five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's the bottom speed limit. That's the slowest you can go. Yeah. <laughs> Almost literally with the gearing. Um, yeah, so Obviously this piece is just long right now. I'll cut it off and then make the top uh, top part. And then of course, I'll have to add in a bunch of fittings, um, you know, uh, output at the very bottom, input at the top, and then a couple of lines for these uh, crankcase breathers. This is really my first time doing aluminum TIG and it is so much better than aluminum spool gun. Uh, it's actually surprisingly easy, so. Obviously not the most perfect beads ever, but they'll do the trick. If it's in there, something like that. So from this angle, you can totally see it. Yep. That's so cool. <laughs> is all welded up, even filled in the hole in the E. And um, now I took this piece off of the original oil tank here, which has a hole for a dipstick, so we can actually have a dipstick for checking oil level, which will be sweet. Um, it has the return line, oil return line, and it has a spot where this breather hose goes on there. So all of those pieces in this one little chunk of aluminum that I have a hole cut out for, and it sits on there nice and flush and gets the dipstick going down at an angle that works, because obviously if it was at the wrong angle, it would run into the sides. So time to uh, tack it on there. So I've got this uh, filler hole, dipstick, oil return line, and vent tube mounted all on there. Dipstick. Um, 
and a bracket here to bolt it all on. I'll show you how that fits. Right like that, and it goes to the engine mount bolt, so I didn't have to add any bolts or anything. And then the uh, so the oil return line will go to this, we'll wrap around somewhere under here to the engine. And then right now I'm working on the oil pickup line, which obviously will be as close to the bottom as possible. I'm gonna do the same thing I did for this and cut it out of the bottom of the tank here because this already has a pickup screen and a little ball valve in it, a one-way valve. So cut that out, cut a hole in the tank right here and weld it on just like this. oil outlet all uh, welded on there. It was very sturdily mounted inside here. That was all supporting that section, but that's because this thing was cast, uh, not fabricated. So anyway, that's in there, oil screen's in there, so that's the outlet, and you can see, uh, you can see in there, but there's a little teeny tiny spring and a ball, ball bearing that makes it so that it can't backflow from the engine into the tank. Um, and then I also decided that obviously it needed a drain plug because, you know, can't cut any corners on this one. And this is about as close to the lowest point as you could get for the pickup. But the oil level is going to be way up here, so the chances of it starving for oil are extremely slim. I have the little fitting there. I just need to cut out that chunk, which hopefully isn't supported to this ridiculous extent that the other one was and then uh, weld that in somewhere in here and we'll be in oil tank business. the oil tank all finished up. Um, I'll probably add one more mount to it at some point, but for now um, it'll work. And we've got the two vent hoses that go up to here. And I have the oil lines, both the pickup and return lines plumbed in. So you can see under here the metal oil lines that uh, feed into the bottom of the engine here. Um, those are actually the original lines. I just changed up their routing a tiny bit. So this is the pickup line and it goes right to the bottom of the tank here. And then the return line goes around between the drive shaft and the steering column and sneaks up through here to the top of the tank to refill at the top. So um, it's actually quite similar to the original setup. It's just the tank's a little bit different shape. It's actually kind of in the same location as well. And what's cool about the tank is because of the shape of it, it's tall and skinny and it's all sloped towards one side. So that means that like, you'd have to be completely empty in the tank to have any chance of starvation on cornering or acceleration or anything, which is really good. So, um, you know, cause the oil level in the tank will probably sit somewhere in here. So no chance of starving. It'd have to be upside down to starve the pickup tube, which is what you want. It's time to test both the volume capacity and the uh, water tightness of this. Although I'm gonna just use some used oil to fill it up um, for a couple reasons. One, so that we don't introduce any water into it, just in case, and also the oil will help like pick up any particulates left in here and wash it out. Um, and then of course we'll clean it out before we use it. But uh, also the oil's in a jug with measurements on the side so we can see how much we put into it. Not seeing any leaks yet. I just looked it up on my phone and the 990 Adventure had, uh, specs are three liter oil capacity and presumably that's tank and engine combined, which it's, it is a dry sump, so there's not really much oil capacity inside the engine, but some. And we just filled this up and it's not 
plumb full, it's probably down to about here. So that's, you know, leaves room for expansion and whatnot. And that is about three and a half quarts. So three liters is 3.2 quarts. So we started with just over four quarts of oil in this bottle. And now we're just over, th uh, we're about three quarters of a quart left. So about three and a half quarts, which is perfect. You? I deal. Um, now that we have that done, next video we will be uh, wiring up the ECU and getting it ready to hopefully start and then uh, working on the exhaust system as well. Basically everything we need to do to test start it. So look forward to that. It's gonna be a rowdy good time. You.